on the other slide, that's one of the hydrodynamic observation points where we measure the, the waves and the currents. And here's the wind uh, station at Diamond Shoals that we're now forcing the model with. But we're starting to compare to some other points here where we don't have the wave and current observations. We have sediment cores. We can get some things out of sediment cores that can help us understand how the system changed over that time period. And here's the record of, of, uh, of recent sediment cores and seismic surveys, those are shown by the lines and the cores of the circles, that were used to develop the different bathymetric scenarios in this study. So thanks again to Nick and to Dave Mallinson and others at East Carolina for doing this work to provide and, and really use the seismic data, interpret the geology in conjunction with the sort of in situ validation uh, with the cores, and in conjunction with the whole series of cores, put together a whole bunch of surfaces, paleobathymetric surfaces, so 4,000 years and different times where we have these horizons, we can map them out through time, and we can come up with new paleobathymetries to put into the model. On top of that, over that time scale, sea level rise, if you believe it, which I just heard some people don't <laughs> <laughs> in this state, um, and, it's <laughs> and it's different in different parts of the world, we do apply sea level corrections to the model mean water levels. So, so that's, you know, there's a lot of room for debate, for real, <laughs> in, that, in that field. But in the estuaries, those sediment cores are recorders of, of things that have happened in the past. And others, not only uh, Nick, uh, Nick Zaremba and Dave Mallinson, but another guy named Ben Horton has done a lot of work to look at um, mean sea level changes over the last few thousand years. So we're using those sea level curves to change the mean sea level. So... We're changing the mean sea level, we're changing the shape or the bathymetry, and we're doing one more major and important thing. We're changing the location and the width and the number of tidal inlets. In the present day scenario, so this is the grid for the present day, we have Ocracoke Inlet, Hatteras Inlet, and Oregon Inlet. But about 500 years ago, we had a whole bunch of little inlets as evidenced by other cores taken over the islands. A thousand years ago, we very likely had a very wide inlet, Ocracoke Island itself was really not there, and a series of other inlets. 4,000 years ago, we didn't have these other inlets here. We had some other inlets farther south that were So very different scenarios. And, you know, the interpretation for this is that over time, we get big hurricanes. We get big hurricanes that cause major breaches and overwash deposits and change the whole system that then recovers to some quasi-steady system until the next major storm. Now, in this case, over 4,000 years, we might not be talking about one storm, but we might be talking about uh, several decades or hundreds of years with intense storms that make a lot of changes to the system. <clears throat> okay, so that's really, that's really the, the founding um, sort of part related to the model and where the all the geological input goes into these grids then we can run the model, the same forcing conditions, and really just compare the results and look at the differences and see how those different um, grids with different inlets influence the waves and the currents, essentially. How would a sea horizon shape and turn to mitigate ice or what? Tell where you're from, your coast. I will defer geological type <laughs> questions to Nick. I'm very glad he's here. <laughs> Thanks. I could have guessed wrong. <laughs> This, okay, yeah, that's a good question. They would, they would have moved, and we don't necessarily account for that. Uh, in this 4,000 grid, the shoreline has been moved significantly, but in the other ones, it hasn't really. It's just the locations of the inlets. So a sort of predecessor to this more geologically based work was, um, you know, when I did some initial tests just by opening inlets in various places to say they're more or less connected. And there's, a big, there's sort of a strong signal there, but there's no way to really, you know, quantify... Um, the changes that would occur in the basin unless you get towards a more realistic scenario. And of course, this is an interpretation. And some of the model results, you know, might suggest that though this interpretation is not 100% right. But at least it's based on some geological data, and there's some supporting geological data I'll talk to you about in a minute. One other aspect of the model is not just to simulate the waves and the currents, but the transport of water and the salinity of the water. So we have an ocean here, 
that's salty. We have rivers coming into the system that are fresh. And we have a brackish estuary that grades from salty, uh, sorry, from fresh to salty in Pamlico Sound. And most of Albemarle and Kurotuk Sound is quite fresh because there's a very shallow um, connection here and there's limited exchange in between. So this is the initial salinity map for the model. That's derived from observations from a, an important paper in 1989. Doesn't therefore match the exact conditions, but we need a starting point for the model. We have a whole bunch of <coughs> validation sites thanks to these observation uh, programs run from the other universities in North Carolina. One is down, uh, down through the Tar Pamlico River system where they go and map uh, and measure the salinity amongst other things as well in the noose and they also have a salinity sensor attached to this ferry. So we have that ferry route where we have some dense salinity observations in time. So for this model, same model as before, exactly same wind conditions, exactly same ocean tidal and water level conditions here. But the other interesting thing is we're now adding the f river flows, the river discharges through those two major rivers. And uh, you can basically see the Noose River uh, has a much uh, flow and sort of a wider hydrograph. So the larger later, the, um, the drainage basin is bigger. Uh, so we have those two th components, uh, those two discharges coming into the model as well, which are quite important when we're trying to look at the salinity changes through the estuary. And this is the modeling time period, same as before, one month of September 2008. And so we're looking at the model results now, not just at the hydrodynamic uh, sites where we're observing. In this case, I guess I, don't, I didn't label things on this plot, but the black line and the blue line, which are fairly closely overlapping are the model results in blue and the observations in black for the water levels at that particular site. And the other colors represent the water levels for those different grids, the different paleo grids over a selected part of the time series. And now we're also comparing things to the, to the core sites. We don't have the, the observations, the black lines, but we're doing that as well for the currents. What you can see as you get to some of these core sites, even though we don't have the time series over the last 4,000 years of the current speed, you can see that the mean current speed changes quite a bit because we're getting close to bigger inlets or, or other inlets that were there in the past. And we can see some pretty important salinity changes at these sites as well. So if you look at, um, if we look at the present day, which is blue, we have sort of a mean at 27, we're going up to 28, we're going up to 29. There's some a lot of dynamics here because this is forced with real wind and tidal information. It's not a long-term average, it's the real fluctuations. So we see a lot of fluctuations, but we can see the mean is changing as well. So what is causing this transport? Well, we have in the present day case, we have these tidal inlets where we get really strong flows. These are on the flood tide, so water's coming in to those inlets. And then in the other scenarios, you can just see wherever we have an inlet, we have higher currents, we have more transport water, and we end up with essentially different time series of currents, typically stronger for these water inlets in the middle of the sound. So we get a lot, of, a lot more energy under certain cases than we do under others. Same thing, but this is for the ebb tides. We just see a very different pattern. So whenever we have a different uh, morphology of the basin with a, uh, different inlets, we see different flows into the system. Therefore, we can transport different amounts of whatever's in the water. So if it's fresh water versus salty water, or if it's suspended materials like sediments. One way of looking at this uh, sort of long-term predictions to actually think about the sediment cores themselves what grain sizes we get from those cores correspond very generally to the velocities we get at those locations. Now this is a really nice looking one, so I'm showing it. Some of the other ones don't, show, don't look as good. But you can just see that we only ran the model at selected time slices, and then I'm kind of showing them like they apply over those long time periods. But those time periods apply in the cores to different textural units. So that's kind of promising. And I was really thinking about this. I'm thinking, like, what can we do in the geological record 
that will match these short model runs. But this is one way of doing it, and the other one I'll show in a minute. The other thing we're able to do with this model is just think about waves, uh, because when we have different connections between the estuary and the ocean, uh, and different um, bathymetries in the basins, we can have different waves in the estuary, which can affect, then uh, therefore affect the bathymetry in the estuary, and it can affect the shorelines. So when we have wa uh, winds from the south, we have some um, waves passing over and through this inlet, although it's still quite shallow in these inlets, and typically that doesn't affect it, but the basin is deeper in this case. So you see the waves are kind of more red, so they're higher. That means more energy at the shoreline for erosion. And then for uh, winds blowing from the south, um, you know, sort of a, a similar pattern between the two, but really uh, the, the wave height at any one point really does depend on the fetch, the wind direction, and the depth. In these, uh, in these basins, even when we have the connections to the ocean. Back to salinity, uh, and not thinking long term, but just back to the present day, how does this model transport salinity and does it work? Well, similar to the plot I showed earlier of the water levels, now we're showing a plot of the salinity at uh, the surface and the bottom, and the colors are the observations, and the, uh, the contours behind that is the model. Things look pretty good. It's not perfect. Uh, and looking through the estuary, we can see that in this case, uh, the Tar Pamlico system, a little bit off at the beginning, but things become quite well mixed. So the surface and the bottom are matching in the model, and uh, the observations are lining up fairly well. Uh, similarly, in the noose, but with much higher flows, the model is not really getting it right in this part of the region. And then once we get out to Pamlico Sound, it's very well mixed by all the winds, and we have a fairly good combination of, or comparison between model and, and observation. So what we're getting here is essentially, you know, this is a fairly well validated, or at least shown to, to match with observations, model that we can then look at the past changes in salinity. Here's the other set of validation data. This is nice because, uh, I'll just back up, we only had one day to compare to here, so obviously we're doing all of that. That was at the end of September. So this is a comparison for a particular time at the end of that month. It's not an average over the month. It's at the very end of that, that model run, which is a month long. Now in this data set, which is on the ferry, we get data every couple days or whatever, every day or whenever they happen to collect it. So in this case, we see some very different dynamics. And this is sort of before and after, during and after uh, a strong wind event. So again, the, the model results aren't perfect, but what we do see in the observations, which are the circles in the model, is that we have a salinity plume on this side, higher salinity coming in from the ocean, and lower salinity from the two river systems, essentially mixing and coming in on this side. A few days later, we get something very different. We have some higher salinity sort of over here, maybe a lower salinity tongue in there later, we have even lower salinity. This is after that um, large discharge through the system, so we have a lot more fresh water. We've had winds in a different direction, and we end up uh, not an exact match, but we have some sort of tongue of high salinity water coming in through the inlet that's over on this side, and very low salinity over on this side. So that's our uh, sort of detailed comparison. We can compare you know, specific days, times, and places for the salinity of the model. So it works fairly well. But how do we compare that to the geologic record? Well, in the geologic record, we collect these little forams. We do detailed analysis. And by we, I mean not me. I mean people from East Carolina that have picked through the sediment cores, look at the different um, species, and estimate the salinity in their environment of formation, and come up with a, a record, down core record of salinity changes. So we're using that kind of information in those model runs. And now we're comparing again to, uh, we're comparing the different model runs. We see the four different cases here. This is at the end of the model run, at the end of the sort of 30-day simulation. And the main take-home point here is that you have sort of an orangey color here and a more red color over here. The red color simply means you have higher salinity. It's a more marine environment. You have ocean water in there. That's because their inlets are wider and or there are more of them in those times. 
Superimposed on top of that, we have some salinity ranges estimated from those cores. And in those salinity ranges, we cannot get down to the details. We cannot get down to the decimal places of salinity like we can in the model. But what we can do is define these ranges. So what we do see that, that matches fairly well, and at least I think proves, um, proves the, the, the point that the method is worth, uh, is worth trying or, or maybe using <laughs> or, um, or something, is that we see lower salinity in the middle of the estuary at those cores. And that's 20 to 25. A little bit higher in this one, so we're going a little bit towards that side. And then if we go to a time when we had a lot of little inlets, we see some sort of intermediate salinities everywhere. If we go to a time when we have bigger inlets or, uh, or more inlets to the south, we see these places where we have essentially marine salinity conditions. And things definitely don't match everywhere. Obviously, we, we have a problem over here. But we're not simulating those long-term changes. We're simulating the fluctuations over a short time. But we're seeing a pretty promising result in that the sort of bulk comparison between model and um, the salinity developed from the cores. But more importantly, just the transport of sediment under different conditions with different morphologies and inlets, you see uh, essentially higher uh, salinity on the eastern side. And in some cases, you get more or less transport and exchange between the ocean and the sound. Last thing to mention is, uh, is the suspended sediment concentrations. And that's actually the subject of my next talk, which I'll give in a few weeks. So I haven't quite finished it. But here's uh, some, of the, uh, some of the results is that we're also modeling the suspended sediments. In this case, you can see that these colors um, in these two plots correspond to two of the different um, scenarios at the present and at the 4,000 calendar years before present time. Uh, and this is actually the, the fine sediments, not the sands, the fine sediments like silts or muds. Because those sediments tend to come up into suspension with a little bit of wind and stay in suspension. The sands, which essentially in this plot are shown as the blue because they're very low concentration, they come up into suspension during strong winds, which happen frequently, but they quickly settle out. So if you look a little bit, if you look right during the peak of winds, a wind event, you'll get really high suspension in this environment. But if you wait until after the storm, the sands settle out, the finer stuff stays in suspension for a long time, typically um, for quite a long time because we have another storm just a day or two later. So we're starting to look more into the suspended sediment concentrations by simulating those and comparing those with observations where we have turbidity observations in, in a couple places over here. And that essentially uh, concludes the talk. I was trying to, to bring together a few issues in the same environment. And really, it's looking at the different time scales and trying to you know, put them together and what feeds back with what. In the shorter time scale, it's you know, really the major events that can be very important where the hydrodynamics can change the morphology. They can overwash, they can breach, and things like that. Over the medium time scales, sort of the typical wind and tidal conditions, Whatever the morphology is, stuff is in suspension, moving around a little bit. But the hydrodynamics depend on where the inlets are and where they're not, things like that. Over the longer time scales, so geologic time, the morphology gets completely changed by the hydrodynamics. But then the hydrodynamics completely respond to that new morphology. So that's the most feedback. Obviously, there's the longest time here for the feedback. But that's when things are most important. So I've just really been thinking a lot about these different, uh, these different connections. And I think it's important to look at the different time scales, what processes are occurring on what time scales, what processes interact with each other, and how the different things, processes, and time scales are all connected. A couple of acknowledgments. Uh, Greg Clooney's was my student at Queens who's just finished. And he, he's done some of this modeling work, so that thanks to him. And most of the other um, collaborators here are at East Carolina. So Dave Mallinson is and I have really worked together to, to come up with this project. And Nick uh, has been a big part of that project. And some of the other professors and other people at ECU have helped out a lot. And I've also worked a lot with people at the Army Corps to, to think about things like this. So thank you very much, everyone, including Nick. <laughs> <clears throat>
doing these farmers, yeah. it does kind of look bad in the dorm because it's got landfill and the drainage. Did mm -hmm. you look at something like NAM that's a little higher resolution? We didn't. Uh, the, the main point there is, is you're, is you're right. I said the temporal resolution was low, but also the spatial resolution is low for a place like this. So, uh, so for this scale. So originally I thought at this scale, that might be a better thing. Uh, but 32 kilometer resolution is not good enough. And there are other products at higher resolution that I just haven't tried, I guess, yeah, or don't have. Seven or maybe even four now, so Kilometer. Yeah. yeah. And there's other, um, even if they don't exist, I think if you, you know, know the people at the weather service, you can get them to run them or whatever. So there's other uh, possibilities that would help. And, and you can see just from the NAR that there's a, there's a big gradient, and that's sort of quasi, it, it is realistic, but the details are missing from that particular case where we don't have um, the strong winds over the middle of Pamlico Sound correct, just evidenced by the fact that the model doesn't compare well. Um, if we had a buoy out in the middle of Pamlico Sound, that would solve it, but we don't. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had the choice between uh, taking a small number of large chunks out of the barrier mm -hmm. for connectivity or a lot of small and shallow ones, mm -hmm. Uh, which one would have the most impact in terms of connectivity? I mean, it, it looked like if you had more gaps, you had more marine connectivity for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it probably should be evaluated by the total discharge or something across those areas. But I think that we have a case, which is a 500 year case, where you have the most inlets and they're all small. And locally, those will dominate right around the inlets, but in the middle of Pamlico Sound, it doesn't make a huge difference. Whereas the, the, the other cases had the big, only two, one or two big inlets, and they completely changed the, the currents and sediments in the middle of the sound. So locally, any, close to any size inlet will matter, but on the larger scale, the bigger inlets matter. And we don't necessarily have the depths even right. You know, we don't have the inlets exactly right, but they're, they're different enough from each other to kind of lend some insight into the situation, I think. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how's how do you get a salinity measured from the core? Well, it's the 4M shells. So those uh, creatures that get buried in the sediment record, that shells are based on the, the salinity of their environment. And those creatures are cataloged, and then, yeah, their salinities are determined. <laughs> I don't know exactly. Estimated. Yeah, estimated, yeah. Yeah, so you can see we have a range of 5 PSU, and that's actually a pretty wide range. So we kind of bend it like that just to show the bulk differences. Um, paleo oceanographer type people would be able to go into more detail on that. But there's a, you know, if you ever look at one of these 4M, 4M aniferal type papers, they're really interesting. And they, the shapes and the, the details of these little creatures are completely different. So a person that's trained to see the different species can know exactly what they are and then can tell what kind of you know, from all the past studies, what kind of environments those pertain to. And what we do see, um, if you look at, you know, a plot